Hi, this is Evan Beach again. I'm a research scientist at the Center for Green Chemistry and Green Engineering at Yale University. We're going to finish this lesson by showing how scientists, researchers, and companies are already putting green chemistry into practice, both affordably and practically. In the last module, Module 3, we discussed how the 12 principles of green chemistry can be used to specifically design solutions to problems found in traditional chemistry. Without these specific solutions, there can't really be any real change. In Module 4, we'll explore specific examples of solutions that have already been invented and put into place, designed by chemists working to increase sustainability throughout the chemical enterprise. If we look at sustainability as a puzzle, you could think of this as the last piece we need to complete it. Over the past 20 years, scientists worldwide have been putting green principles and technologies into practice. The result is real-life success stories, and some of those we'll talk about in this module. We're going to look at three examples that you could think of as puzzle pieces falling into place. These will highlight greener reaction conditions, greener polymer design, and sustainable molecular synthesis pathways. In our first example, ideas from several of the principles of green chemistry were incorporated to create a set of greener reaction conditions in the manufacturing of one of the major components of a torvastatin and that's the active pharmaceutical ingredient in the cholesterol drug, Lipitor. The major component in question is called hydroxynitrile, or HN for short. We've drawn that on the left here. And that eventually forms the dihydroxy side chain in the torvastatin. You can see many of the elements are the same, both the starting material and the final product. And it's a chiral molecule. In other words, that means its mirror image is a different chemical with different properties. They're not equivalent. And that adds to the challenge of making HN. If the wrong enantiomer or mirror image is formed in the manufacturing process, then it can't be used to make the pharmaceutical, and that leads to waste. The traditional ways of manufacturing HN were problematic and begged for improvement, and we'll use this small factory here to illustrate the process. Toxic reagents like hydrogen bromide were needed. A protocol called for high heat and high alkalinity to promote the reaction. Demand for solvents was higher, and purification systems led to a very low yield, creating a highly inefficient process overall. Unless the process began with chiral starting materials, some of the chemical steps would lead to equal amounts of the two enantiomers, leading to a maximum 50% yield of the desired mirror image. And we're showing that here as plain HNs and italic HNs, with all the italic ones adding to the waste stream. Overall, these conventional processes generated large amounts of waste, increasing hazards to both the environment and workers. The greener method, developed by Codexis, puts green chemistry principle number nine into practice by using three designer enzymes as catalysts to make the whole process more sustainable. Use of these catalysts reduces the formation of waste and solvents, improves purification, and increases the efficiency dramatically. In fact, it increases the efficiency by a factor of 100 for the first step in the process, and a factor of 4,000 for the second step. The enzymes construct HN in water at neutral pH and mild temperature. All of these conditions improve worker safety. Just this one single greener approach can have a huge impact if you consider that more than 440,000 pounds of HN is used in the pharmaceutical industry every year. Codexis won the 2006 Presidential Green Chemistry Challenge Award in the area of greener reaction conditions. Pfizer, the manufacturer of Lipitor, has incorporated this method into their manufacture of the pharmaceutical. Even better, academic labs and other pharmaceutical companies are continuing to develop better ways to prepare this essential component by starting from cheaper bulk chemicals, developing faster and more potent biocatalysts, and further cutting the waste. Our second example of green chemistry in practice will look at design of greener polymers. Jeffrey Coates at Cornell University uses green principles in development of polycarbonate plastics. 
And those are found in everyday things like CDs, DVDs, and eyeglass lenses. Traditionally, synthesis of polycarbonates would require the use of phosgene, a highly toxic gas. It's so toxic, in fact, that it was used for chemical warfare in the First World War. The old process also used sodium bisphenol A, another known toxin. While this method is effective, it certainly doesn't follow the principles of clean chemistry. Professor Coates' method, instead, uses CO2 as a renewable resource that's cost-effective, far less toxic, and it's typically available as an abundant byproduct of other industrial activity. So it can be used to make polycarbonate products more sustainable. In the process developed by Coates, CO2 and epoxides are linked together by a zinc diaminate catalyst. The zinc catalysts are highly active and they allow a chemist to control the structure of polymer to get a distribution of molecular weights that can lead to better polymer properties. The catalyst can combine with a variety of starting materials with CO2, leading to new polycarbonates useful for many industrial applications. In the scheme we're showing here, CO2 is reacting with limonene oxide, and that's a byproduct of the citrus oil industry, leading to a polymer that's 100% made from renewable starting materials. As you can see, this process meets several of the criteria stated in the 12 principles, including renewable feedstocks, mild reaction conditions, low or no use of solvents, and of course, use of a catalyst. This is another example of an award-winning design Coates and his company, Novamer, received the first ACS award for affordable green chemistry. In order to be eligible for that award, the chemistry must not only be an improvement on traditional methods, but should also require little to no cost to the manufacturer to implement, which would increase the likelihood of it actually being practiced in the business world. Our final example of excellence in action will involve sustainable methods for organic molecular synthesis. Robert Malechka and Milton Smith of Michigan State University earned this award for improvements in Suzuki coupling, a popular method for building large, complex molecules from simple building blocks. In the conventional coupling reaction, both aromatic rings shown here need to be chemically activated in order to make the bond formation step possible. One of the activating groups is a boronate ester. We've circled that here at the end. In the past, converting an ordinary aromatic ring, like this one, into a boronate ester derivative would require a number of wasteful and toxic synthetic steps. Let's take a look at one of these typical reactions. You would first have to halogenate the aromatic ring. And we'll use chlorine as an example. Halogenation or chlorination is not always selective, and probably some byproducts would have to be separated and disposed of. The next step would be activating the new carbon-chlorine bond, circled here, to be more reactive. And that would probably be accomplished by a green yarn reaction, which inserts a magnesium atom into the bond, producing a highly reactive organometallic intermediate. Green yarn reagents are notoriously difficult to handle. They're usually prepared in toxic solvents, and if there's any moisture present, they'll decompose and just form more waste. Finally, even if you form the green yarn reagent perfectly, when you react it with a boron reagent, you produce the boronate ester you want, but also stoichiometric amounts of magnesium, chloride, and alkoxide waste. And we show those coming off the bottom of the arrow here at the end of the reaction. The new, greener route to boronate esters is halogen-free. It uses only heat and a catalyst to directly activate an aryl carbon-hydrogen bond, which I circled here on the left. The only co-product is hydrogen. The iridium catalysts used are robust and selective. They even allow some of the syntheses to be carried out in solvent-free conditions. This method is a new and powerful addition to the green chemistry toolbox. It's useful to molecular designers faced with the task of building large, complex molecules from simple building blocks. We want to do that in an efficient, straightforward, and environmentally benign manner.
It should come as no surprise, then, that this improvement to the method also earned Malechka and Smith a Presidential Green Chemistry Challenge Award. What we've seen in this module, then, is that the principles of green chemistry have been put into use to create solutions for sustainability that are both practical and affordable. In this lesson, we've learned how to put the 12 principles of green chemistry to practical use. We've seen how they can be used as a tool set to fundamentally change the ways we've been practicing chemistry. And finally, we've learned that they can be used to devise remarkably creative, cost-effective solutions, right now, to problems that we're facing. In other words, this isn't fantasy or talk. Thousands of chemists around the world are creating real change and doing it right now. The more we continue to expand our portfolio of greener chemicals and processes, the easier it will become to choose sustainable alternatives. Thanks for your attention, and always remember that it's your ideas and your talents as students and scientists that make change possible.